if uh, we can all take our places. And it's a large panel, and uh, we have only about a little over an hour. So coffee and muffins to fortify yourself for all the big picture questions. Uh, this is the session on globalization and regionalism in Asia. I'm uh, Bruce Tolentino, the uh, Director for Economic Reform and Development Programs of the Asia Foundation. Uh, this topic, uh, globalization and regionalism, is of particular relevance to our work, the work of the Asia Foundation in Asia. In essence, our mission in Asia is to help create the conditions for enhanced investment and enterprise in the region as a whole and across the countries where we work to enable space for the private sector to grow for the purpose, of course, of improved living standards for all the peoples across Asia. And of course, uh, good productive relations among the countries of Asia and between East and West is essential for that growth and good investment climate. And turning to the topic at hand, uh, there is an interesting thread that has emerged in the debates concerning the global financial crisis in recent years. Uh, this debate points out that uh, the developing countries, especially China and India, have been less affected by the global financial crisis. And that the discussion goes on that their recovery and their growth in the recent year has been better than expected. And it also points out that uh, the U.S. in particular hasn't been able to recover as fast as anticipated or as fast as hoped for. The question then is, uh, will China and India pull up the rest of the world as they grow faster? And we're hoping that China and India can save all of us. That is, will the economic reforms and growth in the East be deep, aggressive, and large enough to pull all of us along. Of course, this debate is just a variation of the old debate that talks about decoupling or uh, being coupled together, East and West being interdependent. And I'm sure that our colleagues on the panel will address this question at least to some extent. And I hope that we can all learn from it because indeed we are in just one planet. I won't need to introduce all of them. Uh, all their bios are in the handout, so that saves us some time. And let's turn now to the presenters. Uh, first, uh, Don Emerson. Some years ago, Charles Krauthammer famously identified what he called the unipolar moment. Post-Cold War, this moment stretched into uh, <clears throat> an hour, a day, a month, a year, years. I think it's time to permanently exorcise the ghost of Krauthammer and suggest that whether we like it or not, we are moving on the spectrum from unipolarity toward multipolarity toward the latter end. Um, I'm not quite willing to say we live in a multipolar world, although I noticed that Chris just a few minutes ago said Asia is a multipolar nuclear region. Uh, interesting. Uh, because, of course, multipolarity can be interpreted in many ways. So what I'm trying to argue is that the question is not whether it exists. In some sense, it already does. But rather, what kind of multipolarity are we talking about? Is it interactive? Is it open? Is it cooperative? Is it constructive? Or is it proprietary? Is it a question of spheres of interests? Is it closed? This is a kind of comparison going back in time to uh, the birth of uh, PECC and APEC and some of the other bits of economic alphabet soup to the debate between open regionalism, which some argued was a contradiction in terms. How can you have a completely open region? Then it wouldn't be a region. Uh, versus the, the downside of regionalism, which is, of course, the, the fortress uh, effect, uh, not building blocks towards some larger comity, but stumbling blocks instead. But I do think that we need to recognize that multipolarity is uh, very much with us. And I say this for several reasons. 
Um, it is perhaps more by default than design. I don't think that the chancelleries, the foreign ministries around the world have gotten together and said, okay, now let's institute multipolarity. But it is in some sense an unintended offshoot of actions taken by governments that may have nothing uh, of the sort in mind. It also, I think, refers to another thing that Chris said, namely perceptions drive power. That's a bit of an exaggeration. Some perceptions don't drive power. And when we talk about public opinion, referring back to David Lampton's remarks, <clears throat> the latest survey, which just came out last month from the Chicago Council on, on, For on Foreign Affairs, which, as you know, periodically surveys American public opinion, reinforces what David said. But it's interesting that when you look at the results of that survey, you find not an American conviction that China is a rising star, but that the United States is a declining one. And so the gap in perceived influence is very much a function of pessimism and despair with regard to American influence, not so much uh, the sense that China is becoming hegemonic. <clears throat> um, it's interesting that that sort of pessimism shows up in the survey in, for instance, a rather remarkable result, which is that the respondents who were surveyed felt by fairly large majorities that it was time to institute new international organizations in which the United States would take part. Uh, this is very contrary to what you hear, <clears throat> you know, the wonks, those of us who rotate around regional meetings, uh, the one um, consensus one has, to, at least my impression in Southeast Asia, is that whatever we do, let's not create another new organization. But the American public apparently has other ideas. They suggest that such cooperative institutions are necessary with regard to financial markets, energy markets, climate change, migration issues. And I'm not saying that public opinion in the U.S. is necessarily translated into foreign policy coming out of the State Department. That would be utterly naive. But it is a democracy, and there may be some influence um, uh, that one can point to. It does not necessarily mean that American public opinion is favoring multilateralism in an Asian context. I could go into the details of that, but I won't. Uh, there's still very much a focus on Europe on the part of these respondents. But it does seem to me that perceptions do have an influence on, on what happens and what is possible. Proactively, however, one has to acknowledge the really remarkable, it's not just an uptick, it's an upshift in the American profile in Southeast Asia. I mean, you know, I'm not sure how many people in the room predicted this before Barack Obama was inaugurated, but it has truly been remarkable. And if I had time, I could go and itemize for you the, the history of this upswing in attention. Attending meetings, you know, Hillary is the first Secretary of State who walks actually inside the ASEAN Secretariat, right? And, in South Jakarta. Um, we have Secretary Gates, day before yesterday, showing up in Hanoi at the pr premier meeting of the ADMM, the ASEAN Defense Minister's meeting, plus eight, right? Uh, we have Hillary going back at the end of this month to Hanoi. She'll sit outside with Lavrov, the <coughs> foreign minister from Russia, and wait until the meeting is over, and the heads of state and government, who are already members of the EAS, that is the uh, East Asia Summit will open the door and allow the two foreign ministers to come in, and each of them presumably will have 15 minutes of a total of half an hour, which may not seem like very much, but it is, of course, the incipient event for what will happen next year when the EAS meets again, which, you know, it's a little hard to predict President Obama's travel schedule, uh, I must say, as I know from Indonesian experience. But nevertheless, <coughs> hopefully Obama himself will put the imprimatur of the White House on American membership in the EAS. And it was not very many months ago when this was a severely debated issue inside the Beltway. And there were some who said, we don't want to join the EAS. It's just going to be complicating one more meeting to have to attend. These Asians, all they do is put together talk shops. Uh, you know, talk shops, nothing ever really happens. It seems to me that the administration has decisively, at least as far as Southeast Asia is concerned, shifted in that direction. Now, the irony is, of course, already what we've heard uh, and what I'm going to reinforce, namely that China you would have thought having a stake in multipolarity to reduce the unipolarity and the unilateralism of the United States, especially the first Bush administration, uh, would then be all sweetness and light. And it was. And many people wrote about soft power and the smile diplomacy coming out of Beijing. Let me just give you three uh, indications of how far, at the moment, the pendulum has swung in the opposite direction. These, these are not perhaps widely known in the run-up to the 23rd of July ASEAN Regional Forum meeting in Hanoi, 
The foreign ministry in Beijing instructed the ambassadors to all of the Southeast Asian countries to approach their host foreign ministries and make the following request. Do not raise the South China Sea at the ARF meeting in Hanoi. Now, some of the recipients of that message were a little bit surprised that China would have the effrontery uh, to sort of make that point quite as bluntly as it was made. And so they got in touch with some of the other foreign ministries in Southeast Asia, and the email traffic went back and forth, and they discovered that all 10 had been approached in this somewhat unseemly manner. Uh, second, China also said you must not meet as a group, that is ASEAN, to discuss the South China Sea prior to meeting with us. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, to, 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 to say that we cannot meet is, is just, I mean, it's, it's more than just requesting that something not happen in terms of a policy position that you might take. It actually goes directly against the grain of uh, multilateralism. And in the run-up to the summit that took place on the 24th of September in Manhattan, uh, I'm not exaggerating, the cell phones were buzzing as the Chinese up to the very last minute were putting severe pressure on the ASEAN delegates, not to mention the South China Sea, which in the end, as has already been pointed out, they did not mention uh, the South China Sea. Let me end on a forward note. We are on the cusp of an incredibly densely packed series of multilateral events. Whether anything will actually come of these, whether they will simply be talk shops, I leave that aside. But the schedule is really crowded. I don't have time to go through it all. I think you know uh, some of the most important meetings, obviously G20 in Seoul, uh, the <coughs> APEC economic leaders meeting uh, in Yokohama, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what will be interesting to see is what happens next year when Indonesia takes over the chairmanship of ASEAN. One of the things is already clear. On their agenda as chair of ASEAN, and this is not a state secret, they would like to persuade China to get in line and make what is not, I repeat, not a code of conduct. It's not even a declaration on a code of conduct. Repeatedly, this mistake shows up, even in the academic literature. In the year 2002, China and ASEAN signed a declaration on the conduct of parties in the South China Sea. So it never was even about a code, right? The six so-called principles in that, con in that uh, declaration have not been implemented. And Indonesia's priority in the coming year is going to be to try to persuade, in concert with their colleagues in ASEAN, China to begin to implement those particular principles. There is a meeting that may or may not take place in Kunming in January, where China will get together with its uh, counterparts in ASEAN uh, to discuss this. And of course, China's position is that ASEAN has no business talking about the topic. That's one reason why the meeting may or may not take place. I leave it to the sinologists to explain this extraordinary, on the surface, self-defeating shift in Chinese foreign policy but I do want to say that overall, the activity involved, the perceptions involved, in my judgment, are leading us farther and farther away from the dream or nightmare or whatever that Krauthammer had many years ago. Thank you. And now to talk about a potentially new institution <laughs> in Asia, Bill Grimes. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is not a talk shop. Um, and it's a little more specific than a lot of the, the discussions we've had by not a talk shop. I mean, there's $120 billion at least putatively committed to this. So it, it is real money. In 1997, in the midst of the Asian financial crisis, Japan proposed the creation of an Asian monetary fund that would quickly provide massive amounts of funds in the event of a currency crisis in the region. It would do so without the extended negotiations and onerous commitments of an IMF standby agreement. While the proposal itself died, as we all know, the ASEAN uh, economies went on in 2000 to create a partial substitute known as the Chiang Mai Initiative, which serves some of the same functions. But CMI uh, differed in several important ways from the AMF idea, most notably its reliance on the so-called IMF link, uh, by which release of the bulk of bailout funds uh, is contingent on the crisis country entering into negotiations with the IMF. Uh, Last, in the last two years, while the rest of us were sort of mesmerized by this thing called the global financial crisis, uh, the ASEAN plus three agreed to a significant enhancement of this. And earlier this year, um, it was implemented, uh, an enhancement of the structure and procedures of CMI under the ungainly name of Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateralization. While it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue the way that Asian Monetary Fund does, CMI multilateralization has excited advocates of a regional solution to East Asian liquidity crises who believe it is a major step toward the creation of something like an AMF, and I'll just shorthand it as AMF. 
that is no longer dependent on the International Monetary Fund and its burdensome conditionality uh, and U.S. links. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to address two questions. The first is whether CMIM is a functional approximation of AMF. The answer is no. The second is whether CMIM is a big step in the direction of the inevitable creation of an AMF. Here, too, I'm skeptical. The problem with the stepping stone argument is that while regionalist advocates of an autonomous AMF are attempting to come up with uh, institutional solutions to the acknowledged challenges of emergency, uh, emergency liquidity provision, the fundamental challenge is actually one of politics. Um, I argue that the continued mistrust and diverging interests of China and Japan in terms of leadership pose an insurmountable barrier to the fondest dreams of the regionalists. Uh, okay, so first, why the excitement? CMI multilateralization includes a number of institutional enhancement that parallel what regional advocates have been calling for for years. Uh, the ASEAN plus three governments declare it to be a reserve pooling arrangement with weighted voting for disbursement of funds and expanded means of monitoring the economic conditions and policies of the region. Um, as always, however, uh, and I think I'm going to uh, uh, echo uh, the, our discussion from last time, it's important to be careful about the words we use and the context we use them in. For example, reserve pooling does not imply central management and automatic disbursement of funds upon the vo vote of finance ministers. Rather, funds remain self-managed, and reserve pooling only uh, implies a higher rhetorical commitment to providing funds as promised. Whether that commitment will be effective in a given crisis remains unknown. More importantly, despite the excitement over weighted voting for disbursement of funds, in reality the vote does not even take place until the IMF is in the game. In other words, there's no change to the IMF link. Sophisticated advocates of a move toward an AMF uh, argue that the key to removing the IMF link is improved monitoring of participating countries' economic performance and policies. And this is the second question, the stepping stone question. Um, and they believe that if we have better monitoring, uh, if a government brings a crisis on itself through irresponsible policies, uh, it would not be able to expect to get emergency funds without conditions, but would instead have to go through the IMF process. Now, as we all know, IMF policies, uh, IMF plans come with conditions, sometimes onerous ones. Uh, and this is what we would call a form of ex post conditionality, in that the conditions are imposed after the crisis has already begun. What the AMF advocates are talking about is ex ante conditionality, in which countries are forewarned about whether they will receive emergency funds if a currency crisis occurs based on whether they're acting nicely, based on whether they're following responsible policies. Ex ante conditionality calls for both effective monitoring and a commitment by participating states to follow through on the implicit promise or threat, either to support or not to support, the crisis economy with funds that lack strict ex post conditions. To create these conditions, CMI multilateralization is uh, accompanied by enhanced mutual surveillance in the form of uh, improving the already existing economic review and policy dialogue, and uh, very pointedly, the creation of a, an autonomous, professionally staffed ASEAN plus three macroeconomic research office, or AMRO, to do the actual monitoring. The problem is, that neither the monitoring process nor the decision to honor or not to honor the collective judgment of the monitoring operation can be separated from politics. Fundamentally, the reason for the IMF link, which, I mean, let's be clear, nobody likes it, very much at least, is to prevent countries in the ASEAN plus three club from having to say no to a partner in need. If you can't say no to a neighbor that's caused its own problems, then you have moral hazard. But saying no in a group of 13 countries offers no opportunity for plausible deniability. Uh, we've had the elegant solution of putting the IMF in the position of enforcing good behavior. Uh, but if we're talking about moving away from the IMF as the enforcer uh, and thinking about monitoring, then we have to ask ourselves, in what ways can this work? Well, with regard to the effectiveness and objectivity of the monitoring function to start with, why should we expect, this is a rhetorical question, I think I'm probably not going to have to answer it. Why should we expect that a small group of economists seconded from ASEAN plus three countries will be an improvement over the IMF in terms of either objectivity or, com or competence? If we can't separate the opinions of seconded co economists from, say, China or Vietnam or even Malaysia from the opinions of their home governments, then what is the benefit derived from, quote unquote, autonomy for the monitoring agency? Uh, Again, I don't think we need to answer it. There is no deniability in this case, though. 
But let's, let's assume for the moment that I'm wrong about the autonomy of AMRO. What can we say about the credibility of a pledge to follow through on ex ante conditionality? Here the problem reverts to the issue of plausible deniability. In any given crisis, there is the problem of time inconsistency. It is almost always the case that, in a given, that a given crisis would be made better by throwing money at the problem, whether it's domestic banking problem or a currency crisis or whatever. The problem is the long-term result of throwing money at the problem or being expected to throw money at the problem creates moral hazard, which the leading states uh, must seek to avoid. But states in a small club like the ASEAN plus three are under enormous uh, pressure to support a neighbor, uh, and there may well be political advantages in doing so. And by the way, when I'm talking about the small size of this club, and I say 13, practically speaking, the weighted voting system means that we're talking about two countries, China and Japan, which control 64% of the vote. The effectiveness of Chiang Mai uh, initiative multilateralization, therefore, comes down to the ability of Japan and China to work together effectively in a crisis. Or more specifically, the certain knowledge of financial players, of countries in the region, the certain knowledge that they will do so. If neither China nor Japan can ensure that the other's political interests will not trump common economic interests, then the mechanism doesn't work. Um, I think it's fair to say that this is at least in question, that it creates uncertainty, and that uncertainty, or rather lack of credibility, is fatal to a crisis management mechanism, me to a crisis management mechanism. The global financial crisis highlights the essentially political problems of the apparently institutional challenges with which the ASEAN plus three are grappling here. Uh, while my paper addresses the Korean near crisis of 2008 in some detail, um, that highlights a different set of institutional and political challenges uh, that, are, that were made apparent by the crisis, but we don't have time to delve into that today. Uh, so instead, I'm going to uh, turn my glance to Europe, where the fiscal malfeasance of a minor Eurozone country, a lovely place to visit, by the way, but. <laughs> The fiscal malfeasance of a minor Eurozone country demonstrated how profound these political challenges really are. Eurozone membership was the strongest form of ex ante conditionality that anyone could hope to create. But Greece repeatedly and publicly viol violated the rules in nearly every year, every year except for one, let's be specific, every year but one from its entry into the Eurozone. And that's before we consider the government's dishonesty. In other words, even in the U EU, monitoring did not fully capture the problem. And in any event, it didn't stem the moral hazard even when it did. Uh, I don't think I need to remind you all that Asia has nowhere near the extensive institutionalization and, is and issue linkage that makes European decision making stick. The Greek rescue package is also instructive. Even within the most effective and articula articulated supranational organization the world has ever known, the rescue package ended up taking months and involving the IMF. Not just, or even primarily, for the money, but for the ex post conditionality. I'm not going to claim special insights into the merits or demerits of the package itself, but I think we can all agree that part of what we saw was a failure of the, uh, of the famous Franco-German bigemony. And, you know, I guess I'm doing a lot of rhetorical questions today, but do we really think that China and Japan can do better when real money and interests are at stake. Before I finish, um, I think it's worth asking under what conditions I see an autonomous IMF, AMF working. And since we're dealing with big questions about the way that the international monetary system works, although I've been a little bit micro on this, I think it's appropriate to invoke the great Charles Kindleberger, who wrote in 1981, the danger we face is not too much power in the international economy, but too little. Not an excess of domination, but a superfluity of would-be free riders. The dirty little secret at the core of ASEAN plus three financial regionalism is that a necessary but not sufficient condition for it to work effectively in emergencies will be concentration of power. If that cannot be achieved through Sino-Japanese condominium, we will have to wait for Chinese hegemony. Or maybe we should just give thanks for the IMF, imperfect though it may be. Thank you. Thank you. And we should remember that China has been buying Greek bonds. So, and now, uh, David, can please? Um, all right, I've been given five to eight minutes, so I'll try and be short. Uh, first, I'd like to thank NBR and Rich Ellings and uh, Michael Wills for inviting me.
always nice to be invited. Um, also, thanks to Cal and the IEAS. On a personal note, my father lived in I House in 1950s when he came from Korea to study, so it's very nice to be here. Um, go Bears. Um, <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm actually going to depart a little bit. I was supposed to talk about the limits of regionalism. Uh, but I thought it might be better, and I got the okay from the panel, <laughs> to, to engage. I'll do a little bit of that, a point about that. Um, and then actually engage a little bit in dialogue on some of the things that came up earlier. Uh, so, you know, I also am very glad that we're starting to stretch beyond just U.S.-China relations. Because one of my pet peeves is uh, that... It's often put in terms of China and West, China and the West. So you look at all these books, China and the West, China. And there's an entire region out there of other countries. And as somebody who has studied most of those small countries, like the Philippines and Korea and Vietnam, I'm always trying to say the region is actually a region, and there's a lot of other countries there. Uh, and the issues and their perspectives may not actually track the same way that we do when we're looking at China, U.S., China, U.S., um, so one historical note on the regional issue is uh, whether or not regionalism is good, you know, deep, constrains or not, um, the regional integration and the deeply involved uh, trading relationships between these countries is nothing new. Uh, there might have been a small dip over the last hundred years or so, but we often forget how deeply intertwined these economies were for literally centuries beforehand. Uh, even Japan under the Tokugawa, uh, we have this image of a closed country, uh, but it was hard for Westerners to trade there, which is why we have this image. Uh, but throughout Tokugawa, there were over 90 to 100 Je uh, Chinese ships coming. These, these maritime restrictions that the Toku Tokugawa Bakufu put on uh, trade were on Japanese traders going out, but they didn't stop foreign ships from coming in. So they imported over 1,000 Chinese books a year in the 18th century. Uh, over a thousand Japanese lived permanently in Pusan in what we call the Wegwan or the foreign house uh, as traders up until the 19th century. Uh, so the region as a vibrant interconnected trading region is actually nothing new uh, and the relations between these countries is nothing new. Uh, whether these institutions will manage to sit on top and actually constri constrain state behavior is, is certainly another question but it's uh, in a historical context, it's, it's more a return than anything, than anything new. Uh, so now let me shift uh, gears completely uh, and talk about the, uh, uh, particularly the Chan'an incident, which I'm not actually sure uh, is going to play out the way that we, we said it would in the, in the earlier panels. Um, and, and so I'll talk a little bit about China and then a little bit about South Korea, because I don't think China cares at all what we think about uh, the Chan'an. Uh, because throughout the U.S. spectrum, uh, from left and right, everybody heaping abuse on China for not responding more to Chan'an. Uh, and my sense is the Chinese didn't care at all. They have what, what one Chinese guy told me, he called it a Chinese sunshine policy towards North Korea. My sense is China has a very long-term, a decades-long strategy for unlocking North Korea. And it involves essentially pushing investment and trade across the border. Uh, so Jilin province has about $600 million uh, uh, earmarked for investment in North Korea. The traders are going back and forth. Uh, and I think the Chinese think that this is a winning strategy. It stabilizes their border for a bunch of internal reasons. And all this other stuff is, is one more blip in, in the radar. Uh, and that they're not going to stop that. Now, it was very clear they, made, they, they told Kim Jong-il, uh, from what I understand, in, in the last two meetings, don't do that again. <laughs> they were really pissed off at, at Chan'an. Uh, but essentially they didn't care, and they think that in many ways the U.S. and South Korea overreacted to China and are using it for their own purposes. Um, but I think, regardless of that, what I think even more interesting about China is I'm actually not sure uh, uh, how it's going to play out. Um, speaking of opinion polls, uh, you may or may not know that well under half of South Koreans, I think it's about 38%, think that North Korea did it, <laughs> meaning almost 62 thirds think North Korea did not do it, right? And so our conception of how this issue is clearly, et cetera, North Korea, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff, I'm not so sure it plays out that way in South Korea. Right now, there's a conservative government in South Korea, uh, but my, my caution to us is to remember the domestic politics of all of these countries. And it's, you know, at some point there may be a non-conservative uh, 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 leadership in South Korea, and the pendulum will sh shift back the way it was 10 years before. So I'd be cautious about drawing two. I probably overestimated the 10 years of engagement as thinking it was going to continue. 
Uh, I now am wondering that we might be overestimating how long the current conservative government is going to stay in power and continue their policies. Um, and as a, as a second little factoid, uh, there's as many South Koreans studying in China right now, students, as there are in the United States. And there's a bunch of obvious reasons for it. It's closer, cheaper, easier. Uh, the better students go to America, the worse students go to China, right? But the fact remains, it's right there, and South Korea is going to deal with it. And their view of their relationship with all the countries in the region, I think, is much more complex than simply North Korea bad, let's throw a bunch of sanctions on them. Uh, in fact, in many ways, it's sort of embarrassing to watch the two sides fight it out, right? And I think the difference in South Korea may be greater between left and right, maybe greater than between sort of Tea Party and, and, and hippie in America. Um, and so that's, I, I throw that out there just to say I think that the region itself is interacting with China and the U.S. in a much more complex fashion than when we look at simply U.S.-China relationships and, and, and see the kind of things that, that, that we are uh, concerned about. Um, so I will stop there in the interest of time and turn it over to our uh, next speaker. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Um, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for this. I, I speak now as someone who um, is really a, a complete outsider to the particular debates that this panel is having, although also as someone who has spent a lot of time in Asia over the past couple of decades. Um, and I guess I um, want to make a couple of two, two main points. Um, that struck me both in preparation for coming here when I thought about regionalism. I looked at some of the work of, of some of our panelists uh, and also um, that grew out of, of these comments. Uh, uh, the first thing that I, well, the first thing that I did when I was asked to speak here was to think about, well, what, what do we mean when we talk about these multilateral regional institutions? Um, and I had fortunately just recently been to an APEC minister's meeting. I had been asked to speak in Japan. And so I, at that time, went and looked at what APEC was. Um, and <laughs> was kind of staggered by what it included. And you know, APEC includes not only the ASEAN countries, but also includes New Zealand, Mexico, you know, the Russian Federation, um, a, a very heterogeneous, almost chaotic category. Uh, and then when I read um, uh, Professor Grimes' uh, work, I looked, to, I had to figure out what was the ASEAN plus three. <laughs> and, and so I, I went and looked that up. But then on, on the, you know, if you look at the Wikipedia page on ASEAN, you realize that there's also the ASEAN plus eight, which has been mentioned. We have the uh, Asian Regional Forum, which has 27 countries. Um, there's just a, an, an infinite number. And so the first question is, well, what is the region? What is the boundary of this region we're discovering? Maybe this is a heretical question to ask in this setting, but I think it goes to some of the, the deeper issues that are coming up in, in some of these comments. Um, uh, so uh, the, the failure of the um, Chiang Mai initiative to work is partly that we have the politics of China and Japan, but then all these other players and the instability and uncertainty and unreliability of these partners. Um, it, it occurred to me that, you know, what, would, shouldn't India be in that if we're going to be talking about the future financial stability of, of the region? Um, so for certain, uh, I think we are in a multipolar world. Whether we will be able to achieve multilateral institutional governance um, of the sort that we've had with the EU and uh, the U.S. over in the 20th century, you know, is another question. And it struck me um, as I thought about this that um, the attempt to build these multilateral institutions is a bit like uh, reading the future out of the rearview mirror in the sense that in the 20th century, there was an ability to identify both national economies and their interdependencies were fairly clear and it was a stable set of actors. Uh, today, uh, we live in a world where um, new regions are emerging very quickly, economic power is shifting very rapidly, um, and uh, the effort to the, you know, in, in, in the world of the EU and the US and NATO and, and all of those institutions, the national economy was pretty bounded. You knew that there was a French economy and there was an, 
a British economy and a US economy, and each economy had its national champions, so to speak. We had our car industry, our steel industry. We live in a world that, because of technological change, uh, means that industries are spread around the world, and that there is no such thing as the American, really, the American semiconductor industry. Uh, even the American car industry is now spread everywhere. So national bargaining uh, about economic relationships is somehow disconnected from the reality of the economy that it's trying to govern. And, and let me just um, say a few words about my experience at this APEC meeting in Japan, just to underscore this. Um, I was on a panel uh, that was about small and medium-sized enterprises. I, I write about Silicon Valley technology companies. Um, and and uh, I spent a lot of time talking about how you know, innovation could happen anywhere. And that, in fact, we've seen over the past um, several decades, you know, places pop up that we'd never have expected from Israel to Taiwan, which, by the way, I wasn't allowed to mention. I have to just, uh, a lot of my work has looked at the relationship between Silicon Valley and Taiwan, and then, you know, Shanghai, Beijing, Shenzhen. They took all my slides and they said, no, you have to write uh, Chinese Taipei, right? And, and I, so this is the power of China. I mean, just continually, the intimidation of China. Um, so then I said, well, I'm not going to write that. So I would write Shinshu Taipei, which is actually the appropriate region. And so then they couldn't edit it. Um, and then I would write Shanghai and Silicon Valley rather than the US and China. I study subnational regions. I, I suggest that perhaps maybe that's a more appro or an appropriate place to be looking now for where things are happening. Big cities are very important today. The big cities in the east of China are not so connected to the west of China. The big cities in the south of India are less connected to the north of India. So should we be looking below the nation state also? Um, I, I, they even, by the way, the, the, the Japanese even took the, the, I had a map of Taiwan faded in the background and they pulled that out too. Mind you, the other gentleman on my panel who is from Beijing, he's a very successful technology entrepreneur. He runs a company called iGo that makes digital cameras, next generation digital cameras. He had no problem using the word tai Taiwan. Um, he talked about Taiwan, he talked about his world, and his world is a world of traveling from Beijing to Taiwan or Xinchu or whatever you want to call it, to Singapore, to Hong Kong, to Silicon Valley, to Israel, to put together the components for the digital cameras that he's producing. He has no allegiances to whatever the APEC countries are or the ASEAN plus three or plus eight or whatever. So it seems to me that the world that that entrepreneur is living in is so radically decentralized from what this APEC conference was talking about that we have to really reassess where we are looking, what, what is the level of analysis, and how, how will these institutions govern this very different world economy that we live in today? Thank you. Uh, amazingly, we have gained some time. Uh, about a year ago, I was listening to Jay Leno, uh, and he was talking about the academic Olympics that happen periodically across the globe, and pointing out that in many of these academic Olympics, it's uh, Asian students, especially Chinese students who do very well. Now you look at a campus like Berkeley, especially here in the West Coast, and you look at all the graduate students, and you have a lot of young Americans of Chinese origin in these campuses. So Jay Leno says, ha, our Chinese can beat your Chinese. <laughs> so uh, perhaps uh, I'll take questions, and uh, please introduce yourselves. and. Yes, please, in the back. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Alessandro Tiberio, and I'm a graduate student here at Berkeley. Um, I have a question for Professor Kang. Uh, it's uh, maybe like a quite simple question, but basically we talked about how uh, regionalism in East Asia has like a number of different levels and uh, institutions involved. Uh, I see it evolving around Asian plus three uh, with North Korea and Taiwan excluded at the margins. Um, and like, of course, the most dramatic change in this like equilibrium in the region has been the rise of China, as you actually wrote about. Um, and other countries may as well see this rise as beneficial, or I've seen it because I feel it's like now we should talk about a, a rise in China, not rising anymore. Um, but basically, they see it also as beneficial for them and possibly peaceful. Uh, but my question is, how do you see this like recent um, territorial disputes between China and Japan, for instance? or with like the Spalding Paracel Silence 
in the South China Sea. Are you see, uh, do you see these like territorial disputes affecting this uh, regional equilibrium that has been shaping, you know, recently? Thank you. Please, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as we pointed out earlier this morning that certainly China has turned it from smile to frown diplomacy, as Don pointed out, right? And um, uh, it's hurting their interests in the region. But w what I find interesting about these territorial disputes is uh, that they're couched in all these historical terms. Uh, but the really, my, my one sentence history of the world is turning frontiers into borders, right? I mean, that's sort of what we do. We go around, you know, capture the West, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the ones that we didn't actually care that much about were these uninhabited rocks in the middle of the oceans until we knew there was oil. So they're not really historical disputes. They're modern political disputes bought, brought about by an attempt to start defining what, where actually the border is. And so it's not going to be easy to do any of these, right? Um, and it's not just uh, China that's involved. There's six major countries in this Bradley's. Uh, Japan has territorial disputes with every country it could have territorial disputes with. Russia, you, South Korea, and, and China. Um, and there's no question that these are the big ones. I, I wonder, I think the Spratleys might be interesting because of oil, you know. Uh, if it's really about resources, I actually think it's easier to solve because you can divide it up somehow. If it becomes couched in identity terms, like this is our national sovereignty and identity where you can't divide it up, um, I think it's much harder to solve. And that's where I think you've got like Dokdo Islands and, and you know, the Northern Territories, which aren't really about resources. They're about, they're about national identity and who we are. And those are much harder to solve. My final quick question or comment would be, I go back and forth about the extent to which these are dangerous or not, about whether anybody's really going to start a war over these things, or whether they're relatively convenient depending on when you need them, uh, and you pull them out for domestic reasons. Um, and I really go back and forth about that. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear what others think. Yeah. Yes, please. I have two points, uh, and I'm not sure they're really connected, but uh, let me put them out on the table. Uh, the first is that one of the difficulties with thinking about regionalism in uh, Asia, aside from the boundary problem that Annalie pointed out, is the difficulty in figuring out what the relationship is between economics and security. Uh, and to push the economic point just a little bit, one of the interesting things that has happened with East Asia is that virtually every country in East Asia used to have the United States as its number one or number two export market. That has changed, and now the U.S. is sort of number three, number four, number five. Virtually everybody has China as its number one market. The only place that has the U.S. as its number one market is China. So essentially everything's going through China, which gives it incredible economic leverage vis-a-vis -vis its various trading partners. Uh, and so one of the difficulties I think that many of us struggle with is the question of how does this increasing economic interdependence within East Asia play off against these various security issues that keep popping up, uh, et cetera. And I think it plays out in, um, in, in various ways, but one of the things that I found very interesting was after all of the apoplectic tensions about Koizumi's visit to Yasukuni, Japan gets a new right-wing prime minister. The first thing he does is jump on a plane and go to Seoul and Beijing and apologize and say he's not going to go, and he sends a plan to Yasukuni instead of visiting it. But China and Seoul both welcome him. I mean, clearly these are three countries that recognize that they have powerful economic interests that should not be undercut by the sort of what, what many economists would see as these peripheral issues having to deal with nationalism or netizens getting ticked off or, you know, rocks in the middle of the ocean, et cetera. That's one point. The second point, though, is uh, that one of the institutes that in institutions that nobody mentioned is the emerging trilateral uh, relationship among the so-called plus three, the ASEAN plus three, not to confuse the alphabet soup even further, but uh, 2008, the leaders of China, South Korea, and Japan met for the first time in uh, Japan. Uh, they've now moved after a second and third meeting to creating a secretariat uh, to having numerous meetings of lower level officials. And 
at least for those of us who have some hope that the countries in the region can suppress some of the, you know, the, uh, the tensions and begin dealing in a mature fashion with one another, uh, they, uh, they seem to be taking up any and all issues. And they now have a secretariat going forward. They have uh, proposals for a free trade agreement among the three. How far that's going to go remains to be seen, uh, but a, an investment treaty among the three. And as a kind of micro image of all of this, one of the things I thought was very interesting was that in all of the hullabaloo about the Chinese sea captain and whether he would or wouldn't be tried in Japan, uh, the meetings of these trilats went on. And um, very quickly, you know, China and Japan you know, have moved to the point where they're saying, this was not good for us. You know, we've got deeper issues, et cetera. So I'm not sure there's a question in there, but I guess if, if I had to form it in two questions, how do you guys see economics and security trading off within the region? Will economics trump security or not? Uh, and, and if so, where and when? But then secondly, are we also seeing the emergence of cooperative leadership among some of the erstwhile uh, potential enemies or, or um, uh, the guys that are pushing and shoving against one another in ways that might actually serve to reduce tensions? Uh, and let me just leave it at that, and I'm not sure if anybody wants to respond. Anybody? Or shall we take another question? Please. The back. Very back. You guys want to answer that question first? That was, I mean, that was a long question. It deserves yes or no or something. <laughs> Maybe. 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 <laughs> well, let's start with Don Emerson then. A yes or no, is it? No. <laughs> 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 No, I, I think it's important uh, not to fall into the trap of some sort of unilinear relationship between economic cooperation and security cooperation. There's nothing more naive than to think that the <coughs> mutual indebtedness implicit in economic cooperation, trade, investment, crossing borders, necessarily lowers the temperature on political and security issues. I mean, for one thing, that completely ignores domestic politics. It also ignores the, the global political arena. Um, I think that would be quite naive. And in fact, if one wants to illustrate the opposite, uh, in that extraordinary session in Hanoi on the 23rd of July, the Chinese foreign minister, according to those who I interviewed when I was in Southeast Asia last month, uh, basically used this as a club and said, you know, we want to remind you that you depend on our economy. And uh, if you don't line up, I mean, they didn't use precisely these words on the security issue with regard to the South China Sea, you, you, know, you may suffer uh, economically. So uh, it, there's, a, there's a lot of promiscuity here in the way you can link economic interaction with, uh, with, with political issues and security. Thank you. And now, can I actually? I, I, oh, uh, would you like to? Pick yeah, up? I was. Uh, the reason uh, I, there was a, it's a very good question. I was wanted to think, but um, the, the, you know, as 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 I've looked at it, one of the things that's going on with financial regionalism. A lot of people understand it as being a functional thing, which certainly it is. I mean, you, it's driven by the fact that there's uh, opportunities for uh, for cooperation, uh, for everybody being better off, for stabilization. Uh, and, and that's sort of one of the big things uh, that's going on. On the other hand, um, economic cooperation in East Asia is, is at least partly a hedge against dependence on the United States. And, uh, and that's, I think, nowhere no more clear than in the, the financial regionalism story, where there's a, a great deal of unhappiness about the, the way the IMF screwed things up the last time. Uh, a great deal of resentment about U.S. global standards. And, uh, and the, the great irony is that financial regional, regionalism has ended up being basically uh, you know, slotting right into the global financial architecture. But it has to be understood, I think, as a sort of an economic hedge against the United States. At the same time, Japan, which is sort of a, a prime player in this, uh, is in this interesting situation of hedging in a security political sense against China and uh, hedging in a uh, sort of an economic sense against the fact that, you know, a lot of, uh, in the past anyway, a lot of uh, U.S. macroeconomic mistakes end up being paid for, at least partly by Japan. Um, and the, the interaction between those things, I think uh, you're, you're exactly right as uh, pointing out as a problem, but, but they are quite indeterminate. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, there is, um, I think, a very strong effort to keep the United States involved, um, even if in some cases are arm's length at the, at the economic sense, because of the, the sort of security rise of China. 
And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's the it, it's it's yes and no, and it's it's indeterminate. But they're they're clearly interacting, and at different times and places, uh, they're they're quite profoundly important. The uh, you know the the dis, the the relationship between security and economics, and in the long term, you know, I, I tend to think that uh, that that both of those um, forces are uh, you know are going to remain as a, a, a pull and push, and, and the U.S. stays in as an essential member of, the, of the, both the economic story and the and the security story. But the the relative weight to which uh, countries are are sort of seeing that is going to uh, is going to depend very much on on these sort of blips, these things that, that we can't really tell if they're blips or trends, and, and so people do things. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Oh. Um, great thing about the subject of globalization is you can talk about anything. It's great. So <laughs> I, I feel like I've got free license here. Um, there's the classical liberal argument, of course, the standard globalization argument that interdependence leads to some sort of common stake in, you know, good relations and trade and all that. But there's another very powerful, and I would argue more powerful and interesting argument about the effects of globalization um, that kind of bridges some things that Mike Lampton and Susan Shirk said. And that is that all these processes across borders, economic processes across borders, leads to changes internally in countries that would, that would augur toward uh, the middle class staking its uh, political rights at home, interest in the rule of law was mentioned, all kinds of machination, political machinations internally, and of course I'm talking mainly about China. So I guess just to ask this panel and maybe the whole room, because we have some spectacular people, not just on the panel, but also throughout this room, maybe to engage just for a moment uh, to ponder the question, is globalization and all the interconnectedness that China now has, driven fundamentally by its economic um, interdependence with the region of the world, is that leading to some interesting internal uh, politics related to 2012 and the transition that's going to come up then? Are there other things going on that, that people could uh, comment on? Because after all, these are driven uh, it's interesting how much today China's internal affairs are driven by its international interactions, together with all kinds of other stuff, too, of course. But anyway, that's my question. Don. Well, um, are you going to address that point? Okay, please. Uh, and then. <laughs> I just uh, my own uh, broad sense of that is that I'm struck by the political quiescence of the groups in China that have the greatest stake in globalization, and I think that's a puzzle that needs to be better understood. Thank you, and please mm. out there. Um, uh, Dan Snyder from Stanford. I, I wanted to follow up a little bit, echo what uh, TJ was talking about in terms of the Japan-China-Korea triangle, and I want to see if I can get David to respond to this. Uh, by the way, the Japanese already have a, a little shorthand ref term for they call it Nishukan. Uh, so this has now become a sort of a staple uh, of Japanese thinking. And I, and I had a conversation with the Japanese foreign ministry official who was in charge of managing this triangular dialogue, and he was... I was trying to understand, so how do they think about the purpose of this uh, triangle in, in the sort of larger strategic context? And what he articulated, and I don't think he's alone by any means, is that um, this is a means by which Japan can manage China. That's the term he used, manage China. Uh, and I think that in, and, and I think this is why people to some degree have misunderstood, I'll talk about this a little bit later this afternoon, uh, the Japanese the DPJ government's emphasis on East Asian regionalism as being pro-China. Actually, it's not pro-China, it's all about managing China. And the idea is to pull China out into multilateral structures that allow them, that force China to play by uh, 
rules, uh, inter either multilateral, international rules, and, and that's really the, but I hadn't heard a, a Japanese use that term uh, in quite that clear way. I think there's similar thinking in Korea as well on this, and I, uh, I was talking to a former South Korean foreign minister who said, oh, you know, we really, we, the Koreans and the Japanese need to work together because we're in between China and the United States. I hadn't heard that formula before also. And I think actually one of the most interesting pieces of this, there's a lot more Japan-China, uh, I mean Japan-Korea conversation going on than I ever remember seeing before. And uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult conversation for them to have, but part of it is them thinking together about how to manage China. So I'm wondering if, how you see that kind of relationship working. All right, briefly. Yeah. Um, Absolutely right. I mean, I think this 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 relationship is evolving over time. And one one thing I think is that sometimes we get, or certainly I get stuck thinking that some evidence will tell us what the real China is, or you know, and okay, so this is that, and you know, that proves that they're really this or that. But of course, China's changing, like you know, as as was pointed out with the globalization and the middle class changing. I'm not sure Chinese know what China is, right? Um, it's changing all the time, as is Korea and Japan. And I think they're all going through this process of trying to figure out how they live with each other um, in a way that they didn't have to really confront. And you've said this more than anyone else, right? There's this myth of a golden age that everything was fine, but they didn't really have to confront their relations with each other up until maybe the last 20 years or so. Um, and so there's this huge conversation going on about how best to do it. Um, I also think that there's an inevitability in the sense of they're going to have to live with each other one way or the other. And that the, the, uh, the possibility of a stark division that we had during the Cold War is probably unrealistic. So they have to live together. Um, in many ways, their, their social and cultural interactions continue to skyrocket, even as the politics remains a bit, a, a bit behind. So I, I agree with all of that. The thing, I was, I was over in Japan, and there's a, people here like you and TJ who know way more about Japan than me. But I, was, I spent a couple weeks there this spring giving them talks, like Fukushima, Fukui, just you know, outside of Tokyo. It was really interesting, because I found that there was the, the debate there was sort of like uh, uh, about the young people, was how do we get them to be interested in anything about the outside world? <laughs> um, you know, you go to give a talk at a university and nobody knows English, nobody, they have all these things to get them to go study overseas and nobody wants to go. And then I give a talk to a, a, a business group and they all said the younger, the younger workers they're hiring aren't prepared to compete on a world market anymore because they're just not as interested, they sort of given up. And I would actually suspect, I'd love to hear what you guys think, that in Japan there's more of a cultural malaise than we talk about in the U.S., about a feeling of, well, I'm not even sure. So I don't know how that'll play out. This is rambling, but I'll be interested to see, because you know, contending for leadership means that the, the people in the country have to really want that and be engaged in it and everything else. And I think Japan is going through this discussion right now, and there's a bunch of different strands, and I don't know which one is going to win out. You know, nationalism, hard nationalism, uh, just sink gracefully into middle power status. You know, um, so that's a how's that for a non-answer, Dan? Yeah, <laughs> I should be in government. Um, <laughs> shall we take one or two more questions and turn to the panel for final words? Yes, sir, please. My name is Jack Letish. My field is international economics at Berkeley, and there's something the economics profession has come to conclusions about that are directly relevant to what has just been being said. And that is this, that insofar as the development of most countries in the West and in Asia are concerned, it used to be an aspect of vertical integration. Vertical integration enabled a country to specialize without very intricate interrelationships with its other partners. In the case of China, the situation is fundamentally different. Rather than vertical integration, the economic development is in fact one of horizontal integration. And the horizontal integration takes the form of coupling of outputs, of 
people both in China, Japan, South Korea, and has been emphasized in the other countries of Southeast Asia. That is a new phenomenon. And while what has been said correctly, I think, about the lack of synthesis, synthetic relationships between economics and security, it does mean that the fundamental aspects of production today in China's Southeast Asia take a form in which the interdependence among people and companies is greater than it ever has been among other yeah. countries in history. I don't want to reach any fundamental conclusions as to the relationship of this security. All of you are much more expert in this than I. But I will take the liberty of saying the difference, different as the conditions are in Europe as compared to Asia, nevertheless it is a fact that the interdependence in Europe has led to a condition that for the first time in history, for over 50 years, there was no war between any one of them. And that facet, though not definitive, has to be considered only second to another one. And that's a fact that all of you have mentioned. The malaise that exists today in every country, often brought about incidentally by international economics itself, the migration problem has caused a malaise in every country in Europe, which is practically unparalleled. Which means, I think, that that malaise in our own country between the extremities is so fundamental and in the key countries in Europe and Asia as well that one of the most fundamental aspects of what I'll, I think we have been saying for the future is to what extent in our own country can this terrible malaise of the extremes be brought to a moderate position so that our own security can play both politically, security, and economically a more effective role in this new integrative process in Asia. Thank you. As uh, Mike earlier said, how we feel about ourselves. Um, shall we turn to the panel at this point and ask for last uh, words, please? Anybody? Yeah? To close? Well, I, uh, horizontal integration is uh, a reality, and it's a distinctive reality. I think it leads to regionalization uh, and globalization, but not necessarily to regionalism, which I would put on quite a separate track. There are business people, in a sense, who are creating regions or helping to create regions without even having that as a goal. And, you know, they haven't even read the literature, for God's sake. <laughs> right? You know, fortunately for them, because if they had, you know, they might not be trading quite so assiduously. <laughs> Um, so, you know, regionalism is a top-down kind of affair. It tends to come out of the foreign ministries, right? How many Southeast Asians, what are there now, you know, 600 uh, million, something like that, have, uh, have ever heard of ASEAN? If you ask them in a questionnaire, what is it? It beats me, right? So it's an elitist kind of enterprise. Now, I didn't mean to imply, not that any of you said I did, in my comment about <laughs> multi, <laughs> multipolarity, that this would be a polarity, a multipolarity of regions. Jeremy Rifkin believes that, uh, so you can read his book and see if you agree or not. Uh, I do not agree. Uh, I don't think that the European Union is sort of the model uh, for Asia or Africa or, or Latin America. And indeed, the difficulty of even getting into the point where they actually finally signed the Lisbon Treaty has been an object lesson to many in Southeast Asia who feel that the ASEAN way, despite the cynicism of Washington, uh, has been vindicated, uh, and, and that that's really the way to go about putting together uh, 
uh, regions. Multipolarity can exist in, in many different forms. And then finally, you know, let's put in a good word for just old-fashioned bilateralism. One way of interpreting the Obama administration's remarkable shift, uh, in contrast especially to the first Bush administration with regard to Southeast Asia, is that they fell in love with regionalism, right? That ASEAN suddenly from having been a useless talk shop uh, became some kind of mecca for uh, uh, upping the attitudes uh, which had plunged uh, uh, under the Bush administration so that the United States would then be more liked in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's, that's kind of a touchy-feely sort of view. Another interpretation, which you never hear, is that actually U.S. policy towards Southeast Asia was motivated by very real politique notions that were strictly bilateral. That is to say, and this has been, if you will, an undercurrent in U.S. policy if you follow the, if you read the tea leaves over the last decade or so, that there are really only two countries in the region that matter to the U.S., and that's Vietnam and Indonesia. And that therefore the explanation with regard to the security issue in the South China Sea and Hillary, you know, playing a higher profile has a lot to do with Vietnam, a tremendous amount to do with Vietnam. Uh, presumably for geostrategic reasons in relation to China and for other reasons as well, including economic ones. And Indonesia, as the largest country in Southeast Asia, is the other focus. And so that you have, you know, nicely clothed in a rhetoric of regional cooperation, a very old-fashioned sort of uh, almost 19th century notion of dealing with two important countries. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, uh, my, uh, I think Professor Latisha's points are very interesting. I, uh, my old advisor, uh, Bob Gilpin, wrote in a book once, um, I feel like I'm a liberal living in a realist and sometimes Marxist world. Uh, and I agree with you uh, in a lot of ways. I, I agree with the, this point of view about interdependence as being something that creates um, many more opportunities for cooperation and um, raises the costs of, of doing all sorts of provocative actions, including uh, you know, all the way up to, you know, militarized disputes or, or war or whatever. Um, that said, uh, there's a couple things that, that you know, that, that political scientists who look at this have, have spent a fair amount of time repeating, I think, as much as developing. Uh, one is that, that, um, that states end up structuring the relationships between, uh, between the interstate relationships uh, that are economic or social, uh, just as much as the markets do. And, and there are many cases in which uh, the way in which uh, states structure these things has uh, pretty um, uh, profound effects on, um, uh, on, on economic developments. I mean, we can't think about globalized finance without thinking about the specific decisions that were made, you know, going back to the interest equalization tax and the, uh, and the creation of the um, uh, of the uh, of the euro euro dollar markets and, and that's a long story which I won't go into. Another thing, um, and this is something that Albert Hirschman was writing about in the 1940s, is that interdependence is not just interdependence; it's dependence. And there are states that make use of of the dependence of other states upon their economies and whatever uh, to uh, to work to their advantage. Uh, and there's a lot of argument that right now China's been doing this in terms of the, the uh, domestic innovation rules, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then uh, finally, the, the question of uh, Europe, I think Europe is very interesting. I, I think that the post-war Europe actually has a little bit to do with NATO uh, and the Cold War. But um, when we think about the, this, um, I often say that the rise of China is unique and that you have extraordinarily high levels of, of interdependence and uh, 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 you know, economic uh, opportunities for, for mutual gain, uh, but with a fundamentally differing security uh, point of view. Uh, but as you were talking, I, I started to wonder if maybe it's not unique, and maybe uh, we had a, an example of Germany in the 19th century, and maybe uh, we have some things to worry about in, in hopes that, uh, uh, that our common interests can be, can be properly managed, uh, but I, I think we have to be constantly wary. Thank you. And finally, uh, David, uh, briefly, please. Very briefly. Uh, just one thing which might be interesting to, to the, the, the subtlety and the complexity of views in Southeast Asia. Pacific Forum CSIS, uh, who many of you know, has these, these uh, I forget what they're called, backgrounders or whatever. But they, had, they recently had three different Singaporeans uh, commenting on Singaporean views, the diversity of Singaporean views of China and the U.S. 
And I think the first one came out and the second person said they're wrong. But they're fascinating as a view towards how Singaporeans, as one important Southeast Asian country, the diversity of opinions about how they view themselves. So I'd suggest if you're interested, they're very short, they're two pages, uh, just go get them and you can start there for how, how complex the view is from, from, uh, from the region. So thank you all very much. Shall we give a round of applause for the panelists?